Amen. All right, welcome to Wellspring Bible Fellowship. Thank you guys for coming to worship with us this morning. Let's all stand on our feet and hear from God's word. This is the word of the Lord from Psalm 57 at verse 7. My heart is steadfast, O God, my heart is steadfast. I will sing and make melody. Awake my glory, awake, O harp and lyre. I will awake the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your steadfast love is great to the heavens, your faithfulness to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's worship. Strong. From heaven's throne, you came to us and set your heart upon the cross. We'll never know the sacrifice you made. Our sin, for all our sin and all our shame, you took the nails and took our place. No one else could do what you have done. One name, one name is higher, one name is stronger than any grave, than any throne. Christ exalted over all. From the grave. pray, church. Lord Jesus, we thank you that because of your active obedience, that you are the only name by which all men must be saved. Is your name above all? Is your name above death, Lord? We worship you for that this morning. We love you, Jesus. We pray that we would continue to grow in our knowledge of your great gospel, who you are, Lord. You continue to sanctify us by your word and by your spirit, Lord. We thank you for this gathering. 
We just pray that you would be here doing a mighty work among us. We love you and we ask this in your name. And everybody said, amen. Let's stand as we continue our time of singing to our Lord this morning. <clears throat> the story ends. I know how the story ends. We will be with you again. You're my Savior.
the world. There is nowhere else I'd rather be than seated in the presence of my
thousand generations. A thousand generations falling down in worship to sing the song of angels to the Lamb. It's all who've gone before us and all who will believe who sing the song of angels to the Lamb. Your name, your name is the highest, your name.
We thank you for your great name, Jesus. All powers, all thrones, all dominions, they all have to bow to you. Lord, to you belongs the keys of life. To you belongs the great gospel of your righteousness. So, Lord, we worship you this morning. We pray it was a sweet sound to your ear. Lord, now as we transition to hear from your word, we pray that our hearts would be ready to receive what you've spoken. Your word is so great, Lord. We are so thankful for it. Let us not take it for granted, but instead draw us near to you, near to your throne, near to your heart, to your mind this morning through your word as it was designed to do, Lord. We love you. We need you. We need your power. We need your presence always and forever in our lives, Lord, until the day you glorify us where we get to enjoy you, where our faith becomes sight. We get to worship you personally and see you for all of eternity. But Lord, now is a time of hope, of preaching, of growing, of sanctification, of faith. So Lord, help us, bolster us through your word this morning. We love you, Lord, and we ask these things in your name. And everybody said, amen. You may have a seat. Ephesians 3 for this morning's scripture reading. We'll start at verse 14 and read to the end of the chapter there at verse 21. Ephesians 3, starting at verse 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To Him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we are blessed even reading the words of this prayer from Paul and are asking now, God, for your help from the Holy Spirit who is here who resides in us, who inspired this word, would you work to illuminate it to our hearts today, that we might see something of your glory, know something personally, experientially, of your love that surpasses knowledge. Show it to us, God. Impress it upon our hearts. Pour it out into our souls as your spirit works through the preaching now of your word. We pray in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, there was a certain rich, eccentric English man named Julian Morris who was very, very wealthy. And he, however, used to, true story, used to love to dress like a tramp, like a homeless person. And he would spend his days going door to door selling razor blades, shampoo, and soaps on the west coast of England in the English resort city of Blackpool. He would dress in, in an old, tattered, beaten-up army coat and some tattered, ragged canvas shoes. And he went from house to house selling razor blades, soap, and shampoo. And then when he was done, at the end of the night, he would return to his mansion where he would put on formal attire and have his chauffeur drive him in his limousine to exclusive restaurants. Or sometimes he would jump on his plane and catch a flight to Paris where he would spend the evening. And he died at 75 and left a fortune. Now many Christians live something like Mr. Morris, spending their day-to-day -day lives in apparent spiritual poverty and only occasionally enjoying the vast riches of God's glory that their Heavenly Father has given them. And how tragic it really is for us as Christians to be long to the King and to go about in our tattered rags of our own spiritual insufficiencies 
when we could be living the abundant life Christ promised with the resources that God has provided in accordance with his unspeakable riches. Riches. Spiritual riches. Paul wrote Ephesians that the believers there and the believers today would know the truth of our identity in Christ now and, and what are those spiritual riches and resources that are available to us now if we walk by faith in this new identity in Christ. What's ours? What's available to us? The riches. And Paul has been laying forth these spiritual riches in the first three chapters of Ephesians before he transitions to chapter 4 with how to live. Because if you'll recall, the book is neatly broken up, these six chapters in the first three being about doctrine and instruction and, and really I- indicatives of what God has done and who you are now in Christ. Then at the beginning of chapter 4 to get into how now shall we live as belonging to Jesus Christ. And in where we are now, this prayer is a transition between those two parts of the book. Paul transitions with the prayer that the, that the Christians would now experience power, strength, so that we would know these blessings, so that we would appropriate these resources to know his power, to know his love, personally, in your life, because it's not enough for Christians to just understand who we are in Christ and understand how we are to live as Christians. We need more than just knowledge of both of those things. We need power, spiritual power. We need the Spirit's strengthening our inner man to believe it and live it out. We must have God's power to do God's will. And so how do we tap into God's power? Prayer. Paul prays. How do we appropriate these truths that we've been talking about in the first couple chapters? Prayer. We pray. Paul's prayer here is essentially for his readers to experience what he's been talking about in the previous chapters, namely Christ's supreme power and God's great love towards sinners. Paul, the preaching and, and the, the prayer, the teaching and prayer always got to go together. It's, it's one thing to hear it, to to, to understand it and to teach it. It's another thing to experience it. Do you know that to be true, Christian? To experience it in the soul. And that's what this prayer is for. That's what we're after as believers today. The big idea for your notes. We should pray humbly for ourselves and all the church to be strengthened to truly know the love of Christ. That's what this prayer is about. Power and love. And so we should also pray humbly for ourselves and all other believers to be strengthened, to have power, to truly know, to experience the love of Jesus Christ. His prayer here for the saints in Ephesus serves as an example to us of how we are to pray for others. Paul, his heart goes out for these these believers in Ephesus and he wants to pray for them, these things, right? So we, we, we need to learn and model this prayer for others, but also for ourselves. For ourselves, right? Because how are we going to be sensitive to, to wanting to desire this for everybody else if we don't have it ourselves? So we pray this for ourselves and all the church. And the first thing we learn from Paul's prayer here, number one for your notes, pray with humility. Pray with humility, saints. Look again at verse 14. For this reason... I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. The first thing for us to notice here is Paul's posture. He says at verse 14, for this reason I bow my knees. I get on my knees before the Father. Paul is positioning himself in a posture of humility. On his knees. Typically face to the floor, right? It indicates deep humility and submission and emotion before God. Now, this is not a prescription here by Paul for a required position of how to pray. Okay? In fact, the, the Jews, for the Jews, kneeling was much less common. The Jews typically prayed standing, even as we see today at the Wailing Wall. They they stood and, and prayed. And throughout Scripture, we see all kinds of different postures for prayer. So this isn't a a requirement for how one must pray. But Paul here is emphasizing this idea of kneeling in prayer 
And I think we can learn from it. Note a few things here about his humility. A, for your notes, it's a, it's a humble gratitude. He has a humble gratitude as he prays there at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees. Now, a good Bible student is going to ask, well, what reason, Paul? What, what, what prompted this prayer? What is the reason that you're bowing your knees and praying this way? Well, Paul actually began this prayer, believe it or not, at verse 1 of the chapter. At verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, a prisoner, he, he was about to begin the prayer at verse 1 of the chapter, but he took a Holy Spirit-inspired rabbit trail, okay? And that's allowed when it's the Holy Spirit, okay? To talk about his calling and ministry in verses 2 through 13 of the chapter. And so really when, when he says, for this reason, we got to go back now to chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 1 and 2, what was the reason Paul was praying? Well, chapters 1 and 2 are full of the glory of the gospel, this gospel that began in eternity past, before the foundation of the world. These chapters expound for us the riches of God's grace towards sinners, his love towards sinners. Paul was so stunned by the grace of God in saving sinners, by the work of God in uniting these saved sinners into this corporate body, his body, he was just stunned by it, that we're now this temple where God dwells. These are things he talks about in the first couple chapters. He's stunned by it. And Paul, as he thinks of these things, and as, as we ought to do when we think of these things, it ought to lead us to get on our knees and humbly give thanks to be grateful for these realities, these truths. For this reason, I bow my knees. It's, it's really a response of worship, isn't it? Which is what the gospel is meant to produce in us. Worship. To produce worshipers who will worship in spirit and truth. So Paul gets down and he worships. And he bows his knees humbly before the Father with gratitude for these things. Or in the words of Psalm 95, 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. It's a humble gratitude. B for your notes, notice it's a humble submission. A humble submission there before the Father. He says, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That's an interesting phrase. It could be translated, uh, from whom the, the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Because the ESV kind of gives the impression, are we talking about every single family of the planet, right? Every individual family, which would then speak of as uh, falsely of, of the universal fatherhood of God or the universal brotherhood of man. That's not what he's talking about. God is father to his children who are saved through Jesus Christ. So it's, it's speaking of really the whole family of Christians, those that are in heaven now. Think about that. Are they part of our family still? We're all part of one body. They're the church victorious, and those on earth are the church militant, <laughs> still on mission, right? But we are one family in heaven and on earth, and there's no longer Jew or Gentile. We all belong to God's one new family or household, as he says back in chapter 2. And this phrase about the Father's family on heaven and earth that's named by him, that speaks of the Father's great rule and authority. His sovereignty. Our Father is the sovereign Father over all the church in heaven and earth. He is the one we bow our knees to in a humble submission, knowing that, that He's the head of, of the whole body. So we bow in submission. And see for your notes, you'll notice it's a humble confidence. A humble confidence because he says there at the beginning of verse 16, as he gets to his petitions that we're going to look at, he starts by saying that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened. According to the riches of his glory. So we pray humbly on our knees, but with confidence because we know our Father has riches that will never run out. The riches of his glory. Right? Whatever we ask, whatever we think, he's able to do far more abundantly than all of that according to his power. Because how powerful is he? Omnipotent. The Almighty. Almighty. That's the Father. 
And, and this idea here of according to his riches, meaning it's not just out of his riches, but it's in accordance to them, right? As much as is his is yours. Not like a, a billionaire who's going to help you out and give you $1,000, right? That would be out of his riches. No, this is the owner of the universe saying all that is mine is available to you in accordance to all my riches, all the strength you need, all the grace you need. My glory is infinite. My riches never run dry. I will bless you in accordance with the riches of my glory. And so we pray with a humble confidence, amen? On our knees, in gratitude, in submission, in confidence. Number two for your notes, we learn to pray for the favor of God's strength. Pray for the favor of God's strength. This is verse 16 again, if you look at it with me. He says that according to the riches of His glory, He may grant you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being. The first step to living like God's child is to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in the inner being. And Paul prays there that God would grant that. You see that in the text, verse 16? I want you to see it, okay? That, you, that He would grant you to be strengthened. Meaning what? This strength, this work of the Spirit, is a grace gift of God. It's a gift. Uh, would, would you grant that to us, Lord? We're praying for the favor of God's strength, the grace of it, that He would grant it to us. To us, And we need this strength because we are absolutely helpless without Him, right? We are completely dependent on Him for everything. As Jesus says in John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's, that's how dependent we are on God's strength. And I know we talk about this often because we don't get it. We're still so prone to self-sufficiency, right? And, and independence and, and not really leaning on the Lord. Now, I need to hear this every day, just about how helpless I am and also how available His help is. We need to pray for the favor of God's strength because without it, we're nothing. I think this illustration uh, is pretty vivid in terms of our nothingness without Christ. It's from a story called Palm Monday, playing off of the Palm Sunday with the donkey there. Listen to this. The Palm Monday. The donkey awakened, his mind still savoring the afterglow of the most exciting day of his life. Never before had he felt such a rush of pleasure and pride. He walked into town and found a group of people by the well. I'll show myself to him, he thought. He thought. But they didn't notice him. They went on drawing their water and paid him no mind. Throw your garments down, he said crossly. Don't you know who I am? They just looked at him in amazement. Someone slapped him across the tail and ordered him to move. Miserable heathens, he muttered to himself. I'll just go to the market where the good people are. They'll remember me. But the same thing happened. No one paid attention to the donkey as he strutted down the main street in front of the marketplace. The palm branches! Where are the palm branches? He shouted. Yesterday there were palm branches. Hurt and confused, the donkey returned home to his mother. And she said gently, foolish child, don't you realize without him, you're just an ordinary donkey? <laughs> foolish Christian, don't you realize that without him, you're just an ordinary donkey? <laughs> without him, you are nothing. You are powerless. You are helpless. We must realize our dependence on and thus desperation for Christ. Otherwise, we won't pray fervently for his strength as much as we need to. Because we need his strength to do what we cannot do for ourselves. And Paul says here, you notice verse 16, that, that the strength is for, for our inner man, right? Our inner being, he says at the end of verse 16. Strengthen in the inner being. This is the focus of all our spiritual blessings, right? They are primarily about strengthening your inner person, saint, your, your spirit, your heart, 
your mind. That, that is where your spiritual life resides, the eternal life within you. That's where Christ resides, in your heart, right? This is the, the place from which you worship and, and the, the place from which you fight sin. And it's the place from which you find courage to preach the gospel to somebody and the place from which you learn to love people as Christ does. The, the inner life, the inner spiritual life of the man. We know culture places the primary importance on the outer man, obviously, right? On looks and beauty and health and youth and image and all those things. But Scripture says your inner life is far more important, Christian. Is that where you are giving your attention? Is that what you are prioritizing, caring for, nourishing the inner person? When you realize that you are both body and soul, and that these spiritual blessings are for the inner man, you, you realize that the outer man can be wasting away, as Paul says, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, wasting away, Year after year, getting older, weaker, sicker, and yet the inner man should be what? Renewed day by day, he says. It's like two parts of us, and we're going, we're going different directions. <laughs> the body's going toward the grave. The soul is raising to where it belongs, seated in the heavenly places with Christ, right? And one day, the body's going to be raised and reunited. But right now, it's our inner man where Christ is at work. And how is it that we're renewed day by day in the inner man, 2 Corinthians 4, 17, by looking not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen? So what does that really mean? Well, let me make it practical for you, Christian. It means filling your mind and heart every day with the Word of God. That's what it means, to, to focus on the eternal things that are unseen. Study it, read it, meditate on God's holy word, and through prayer you will find your inner being renewed each day. And so like Paul, you ought to pray for yourself and other believers to experience this internal spiritual strength. And what is that strength for? So we go, you know, move mountains or something? Well, in this prayer, look at what the strength is for. Number three for your notes we need to pray for the knowledge of God's love. Pray for the knowledge of God's love. I'm going to read verse 17. So that, here's the purpose. What do we need that strength for in the inner being? What? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength, there's that strength again, to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Do you hear it? Strength in the inner man, strength to comprehend the love of Christ. We need strength to comprehend the love of Christ because it's that amazing, surpasses knowledge. And there's a few things here I want you to know that Paul wants us to know about God's love. A, for your notes, know, know that he wants every part of your heart. A, for your notes, know that he wants every part of your heart. I'll show you that here in the text. There at verse 17, he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Christian, do you realize the mystery and wonder of this reality that Christ dwells within each one of us? Christ dwells in you as a born-again Christian, right? He, not the tabernacle, not the temple, but you in your heart, the living God. And Paul prays for strength so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. And you say, well, wait a second, doesn't Christ already dwell in our hearts if we're Christians? Why are we praying for Christ to dwell if he already dwells in us as Christians? Of course, the answer is yes, he does, right? He dwells in us. So what is Paul praying for here? Well, it's more than just Christ dwelling in our hearts. It's really the idea of Christ ruling 
in our hearts in which he dwells. Ruling, because the word he chooses to use for dwell, strong word in the Greek, katoikio. And he could have chosen a different Greek word, which would have just meant to, in, to inhabit, to just be present, to inhabit. But he st- instead he chooses this Greek word, which means to settle down. To settle down. So Christ is already in the house, but he wants more than that, right? He wants to be at home in your heart. He wants to rule every part of your heart so that he's, he's comfortable there, could put his feet up as the joyful owner of this place, not as, as a tolerated visitor, right? To dwell, settle down in our hearts. There's a booklet called My Heart, Christ's Home by Robert Munger where he pictures the Christian life as a house through which Jesus goes from room to room. And in the library, which is your mind, Jesus finds trash and all sorts of worthless things, which he proceeds to throw out and replace with his word. And in the dining room of appetite, he finds many sinful desires listed on this worldly menu. And in the place of such things as prestige and materialism and lust, he puts humility, meekness, love, and all the other virtues for which believers are to hunger and thirst. And he goes through the living room of fellowship where he finds many worldly companions and activities. And he goes through the workshop where only toys are being made. And into the closet where hidden sins are kept. And so on and so on throughout the entire house. And only when he had cleaned every room, closet, and corner of sin and foolishness could he settle down and be at home. At home. So yeah, Jesus enters, enters the house of our hearts the moment he saves us. But he begins actively repairing the broken down fixer upper of my life. And he will not be at rest or be at home until he sanctifies and matures every part of me. Right? This prayer from Paul is a prayer that Christ would be fully at home by exercising his lordship over every aspect of our lives. And so know that Christ wants every part of your heart. B, know that you are secured in his love. There is a foundation. You are secured in his love. There, verse 17, he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. And I believe the love there is not speaking of our love to God, but his love still toward us. Because lest we think somehow we might lose this love. Paul calls for us to be rooted and grounded in it because it is the foundation. It is the most sure and the most certain thing. It's the foundation upon which our lives are to be built. It is the the soil upon which our, our roots are to go down deep. In other words, be encouraged this morning, Christian, that it's not that he's going to become dissatisfied and, you know, give up on the fixer-upper project and stop loving us, right? As many of our home projects never get finished, right? That's not how Jesus is approaching you and me. What he creates, he sustains and he completes. Rooted and grounded in his love. And so know this morning you are secured in that love. And know this, see for your notes, know the limitless dimensions of his love. The limitless dimensions of his love. You see that there in verse 18. That you may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ. Paul wants us to grasp something here of the the greatness, the vastness of Christ's love breadth and length and height and depth. Now, it's difficult to know precisely what Paul is getting at with each of these descriptions. Unlikely that he is trying to give us four specific categories or types of God's love. Rather, I think he is using language to express the the vastness of his love, the completeness of his love for his church. Every spiritual direction you look, 
you see the love of Christ. Perhaps we could say we see the breadth of it in, in that it's global for every nation. The Jews and all the Gentile nations as well, the breadth of his love. Maybe we could say the length of it is seen in his choosing us from eternity past to, to redeem us, predestining us then in love, Ephesians 1 verse 5. All right, Jeremiah the prophet says he has loved you with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31. So that's the length of it. Perhaps we could say we see the height of his love and that he's already blessed us with every spiritual blessing where? In the heavenly places. He's already raised us up and seated us with Christ in the heavenly places. Can't get higher than that. Perhaps we could say we see the depth of his love and just how far down God reached to the lowest levels, to our depravity, to redeem us when we were dead in sin. The breadth and length and height and depth. God's love can reach any person in any sin, and it stretches from eternity past to eternity future. Amen? Know the limitless dimensions of his love. This morning, church, know that his love surpasses knowledge. His love surpasses knowledge. There at the beginning of verse 19. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. To know the love. Not just know about it. I hope and pray you're not sitting here this morning just knowing about it. Hearing about it. Understanding here something of it. But he's praying that we would know personally, experientially, something of the love. And if you know it, to know it more today. To know it more. And it is a love so great that he says it actually surpasses surpasses knowledge. Right? That, that's why we must pray for strength to comprehend the greatness and vastness of Christ's love. His love is beyond human knowledge. The world certainly can't understand it. They know nothing of spiritual things. But even for his children, it is, it is beyond our human understanding. And it requires divine illumination, which is what I prayed for when we started this sermon. It requires divine illumination. It surpasses knowing. But don't worry, saint, that is not a self-contradiction, right? Where it's like, well, if I, you know, I can't really ever know it because it's not, you can't know it. It's not what he's talking about, right? No, no, no. The Lord illuminates this love to us. He shows it to us. He pours it out upon us to know it more and more. But here, here is something that it does mean. That it surpasses knowledge means that while we cannot know the love of Christ fully, exhaustively, we can, as his children, know the love of Christ truly. And, and we can grow in that true knowledge and experience of his love every day from here on throughout eternity, always discovering something more of the breadth and height and length and depth of that love. But Paul is teaching here this doctrine of God's incomprehensibility, meaning since he's infinite, we can't ever know any one thing about God even exhaustively, exhaustively, because we are finite, right? And yet, because he has chosen to reveal himself, we can know God with certainty. Can't know him exhaustively, but we can know him with certainty. His love is inexhaustible just as he is, and yet he has poured out that love in our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he's given to us. He's proven that love on the cross where Christ died while we were yet sinners, Romans 5. Pray, Christian, that you would know it. And pray that for other Christians. This is, this is like the path to growth in Christ and Christian maturity, right? What, I mean, if there was like one thing you could really nail down about yourself and everybody else that you could be praying for, guess what it's rooted in? We don't really know and understand and believe how much Christ loves us. And we need his strength to comprehend it more. Today I need to comprehend it more. You need to comprehend more. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for myself. I'm going to pray for my family to comprehend this love more because, oh, if I could comprehend it more, well, my life would be changed. That's where change comes. That's where growth 
outcomes in the Christian life, how my life would be different if I was rooted and grounded in this and, and granted that strength because I'm having this focus, I'm having this desire because this prayer is instructing my Christian sanctification so that I'm praying for it to know it more and more. And I'm, I'm praying that prayer on behalf of the saints here at Wellspring, on behalf of the church worldwide. Is the truth of Christ's love what defines you each day? Is, is it your source of identity? That I am the beloved of God. I'm the beloved of God. No. Pray to know the love of Christ. And speaking of incomprehensible, number four for your notes, pray for the filling of God's fullness. There at verse 19, at the end, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses the knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. So follow the train here, right? Prayer for the inner strengthening of the Holy Spirit leads to the indwelling rule of Christ in our hearts, which leads to the incomparable experience of Christ's love for His people, which leads to our lives being filled with the very fullness of God Himself. That is true. Truly incomprehensible indeed. Even for God's children. Illuminate that to us, Lord, right? MacArthur says there is no way this side of heaven we can fathom that truth. We can only believe it and praise God for it. Filled with God's fullness. In this jar of clay, At one of Dr. J. Wilbur Chapman's gospel meetings, a man arose to give a remarkable testimony, and uh, Dr. Chapman used to repeat this testimony to others, but that man said at this meeting, and I'm quoting him, I got off the Pennsylvania depot as a tramp, and for a year I begged on the streets for a living. And one day I touched a man on the shoulder, and I said, Hey, mister, could you give me a dime? As soon as I saw his face, I was shocked to see it was my own father. I said, Father, Father, do you know me? And throwing his arms around me with tears, he said, Oh, my son, I found you. I found you. I've been looking for you. A dime? All I have is yours. And then that man sharing his testimony said this to the group. He said, Men, think of it. I was a tramp. I stood begging my own father for 10 cents when for 18 years he'd been looking for me to give me all that he was worth. That church is a small picture of what God wants to do with his children. His supreme goal in bringing us to himself is to make us like himself by filling us with himself, with all that he is in heaven. Filled with all the fullness of God. Which leads us to number five, because we're going to need some faith for this, right? Pray with faith in God's power. Pray with faith in God's power, verse 20. He says, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Paul moves from all of this, as we might expect, into praise. Praise. Praising the Lord. Such things are too wonderful. I have to stop and I have to stand in awe. And I have to praise the Lord and give what, what's called here a doxology. Doxology means a word of praise. And Paul's praise here is centered on God's power. His power, his infinite ability. To do what? To do far more, but that's not all. To do far more abundantly, but that's not all. To do far more abundantly than all we ask, but that's not all. To do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Oh, with what confidence should we pray, what faith we should have when we pray. Is anything too hard for the Lord? 
Do we believe it? He says there, it's according to the power at work within us. Christian, I don't care how weak you feel today, how much you're stumbling, how backslidden you are, how doubtful you are, all those things, right, can be true. You have power at work within you today. The Holy Spirit lives within you. He is at work within you. We just need to believe it. We need to see his grace and power in our lives and believe it and walk in it. He says, power at work within you. And Christians, we're so ready to say that we believe it's true, right? Just, yeah, yeah, that's what it says, I believe it. But how few of us really enjoy the privilege of seeing him work like that in our lives, right? And why is that? Well, we know it's not because God's ability is limited. But I believe it's because we aren't, again, follow the train of thought here in his prayer. We aren't seeking the inner empowerment of the Spirit to be further ruled by the indwelling Christ so that we are mastered by his love and overflowing with God's fullness. When you do that, if you avail yourself of that, then God's working in us will surely be unlimited. If we do not avail ourselves, his working may be limited, as is God's prerogative to do, because he reserves his blessing for those who fully surrender. He, he reserves some blessing for those who will seek until they're satisfied, until they're filled. And that's what we want to be. We want to be those who pray and ask in faith, faith in the limitless power of God. Church, do you believe? Do you believe that God can do more in response to one prayer? than you and I can in 50 years of our planning and striving? You better believe it. Do we pray like that? Do we devote ourselves privately in our prayer closets like that? Do we devote ourselves as a family to pray like that? Do we devote ourselves to come back together as a church for corporate prayer? Because we really believe that. We believe it. Can his power, maybe you say, I believe that about prayer, but here's your problem. Can his power really work through someone like you? I'm no Moses, right? I'm no Elijah, I'm no Peter, I'm no Paul. Except that James 5 says Elijah was a man of same nature as you, and when he prayed fervently, he saw miracles. James actually makes that point, that Elijah has the exact same nature as you and I. You and I have the same spirit as Paul and Elijah and Moses, right? The Holy Spirit. So do you pray with that kind of expectation in your prayers? You need to surrender to his fullness and his love, and you will see abundantly beyond all that you ask or think. And for what purpose, my last point here, for what purpose would God choose to hear my prayers? Look at verse 21. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Lastly, number six, pray with the aim of God's glory. Pray with the aim of God's glory. All of this is not about us. It's not about you, not about me. It's about God's glory. God blesses his people for his own glory. And God desires, John Stott says, God desires glory in the bride and in the bridegroom. He says in the church and in Christ Jesus, right? So God desires glory in the bride and in the bridegroom, in the community of peace and in the blessed peacemaker. Jesus said. And glory for how long, saints? Glory for how long? Forever and ever. (laughs) Forever God will be glorified by his people. Forever God will be glorified in Christ Jesus, the lamb who was slain. Forever he'll be glorified in saving us by grace and strengthening us by the spirit and dwelling in our hearts through faith and grounding us in his love and filling us with his fullness. Forever he will be glorified. So pray humbly for yourself and all the church to experience this very thing so that God gets the glory forever through you. I want you to take heart today, Christian. Take heart, whatever it is you're going through. Again, God loves you more than you could possibly comprehend, and he wants to give you power to comprehend it more. And take heart today and remember, Christ the Lord dwells in you, Christian. You are the temple, and he wants to make himself at home, in your life. So confess every sin, surrender every part of you, 
Commit to living according to his word each day. And begin that by imitating Paul's prayer here for your own soul. And pray this in love for other Christians eagerly desiring to see them also know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And if we're all doing that for one another, think about it, Christian. If we're all doing that for one another, like Paul's doing for the Ephesians here, think of how, how strong and encouraged and hopeful and joyful and united we can be this side of heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Oh, God, thank you for your great love toward us even while we were sinners and sending Christ to die and now bearing witness to that love by the Spirit in us. Your Spirit bearing witness with ours that we are your children. We do belong. We can never be lost. These things are too wonderful, Lord. We have to pause and just be in awe and give you praise. Praise you, Lord. Praise you and love you and thank you. Glory be to you, God, for all these things. That you would, that you would receive our worship and, and this, this praise, this feeble effort on my part to try to respond to the greatness of these truths is amazing. And yet we know you are pleased with us. You're pleased like a father with his children as we turn and give our gratitude and, and love. Lord, we want to know your love better. We want to be rooted and grounded in it. We want to be transformed by it to such a degree that we are unmistakably yours. And that we would be able to bless other Christians in the same way. God, we ask that you do that here at Wellspring to unite us in joy and love and peace as we seek each other's spiritual good, inner strengthening, being rooted and grounded. Help us speak words of grace, seasoned with salt, to build up and edify. And Lord, hear our prayers. Hear our prayers, and uh, feeble though they be, we know you can do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To you be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. And all God's people said, amen. Praise the Lord, His mercy is more, stronger than darkness, new evermore, our sin.
He lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We studied the dead we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. His mercy is together as a church body. Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Thank you. 